Creating and working on Angular services using TypeScript is where a development team will most likely end up seeing the biggest benefit in terms of implementation and refactoring. The reusability of Angular services allow them to really leverage TypeScript concepts. Let's build a service in our app and learn what that experience is like. Our app needs a service to work with users. We can create a user.service.ts file in our app slash services directory. We want to use the TypeScript classes and interfaces for services. As we learned in the previous clip, we need to start with a TypeScript module. Following our established pattern, we can name this module app.services. Next, we want to create a TypeScript interface to define our service API and a TypeScript class for our service. We can name this iUserService and then create a class named UserService that implements iUserService. When working on our controllers in TypeScript during the last clip, we did not use the export keyword because our interface and class would not be used outside of that controller file. Our services will, and therefore we will want to use the export keyword in front of their interfaces. This service needs a get by ID function that takes in a unique ID as a string and returns a promise that will return a user object. Before we write that interface function, we need to create an interface to represent a user object. We can add that in this file, naming it iUser and giving it some properties. One of our user properties, a list of users' social network usernames, is an array of key value pairs. We can create a property on the iUser interface named social networks that is typed as an array of i social network items and then create an interface named i social network that represents a social network entry. With our user interfaces set up, we can go back to our iUser service interface and add our get by id function. We name it get by id, set a parameter with the name unique id and type it as a string. Then set the return type to be ng.ipromise. The ipromise interface supports generics, so we can use the angle brackets and set it with our iUser interface as the type. Now, we notice that we have an error. TypeScript has identified that our iUser service interface has a function that is returning an interface that is not exported, our iUser interface. So we can correct that by exporting the iUser interface. And then immediately see we have another, our iSocial network interface that is not exported. So we need to export that as well. If we scroll down, we can see we have our IDE telling us that our user service class is not fully implementing our iUser service interface. Let's create the get by ID function and fill out the logic. As we create our function, notice we also get IDE notification that our function is not returning the expected type. These are some of the good that we receive from using TypeScript in our project. For the logic of this method, we want to use the Angular $HTTP service to query our web API for the requested user and return that. But before we write that logic, we need to get $HTTP injected into our service. We will use the static $Inject pattern we learned about in the last clip, add the $HTTP to the array, and then create a class constructor. The constructor will take in the HTTP service, and we can type it using ng.iHttp service. With our inject and constructor in place, we have Angular wired up to deliver the HTTP service to our class. However, we have written our get by ID function as a method on our user service class. In order to be able to use the HTTP service from within that, we need to have our constructor function put that HTTP service into a private field in our class instance. So, we could go up to the top of our class add a private field named $HTTP 
set its type to ng.ihttp service, and then in our constructor, initialize this dot dollar sign HTTP to the dollar sign HTTP parameter. But TypeScript actually provides a shorthand way to do this. First, let's look at the compiled JavaScript. Notice the constructor function is doing our initialization logic and the private field declaration is non-existent. That private field declaration is there for IDE type hinting and compile verification only. It has no bearing on our compiled output. The TypeScript shorthand way to accomplish the same thing is to set an access modifier on our constructor parameter. We can remove the two lines we added and put a private access modifier on our $HTTP parameter, then save, and we can see our compiled code has not changed. So, anytime we need to make parameters available to our classes outside of their constructor functions, we can use the private access modifier to tell TypeScript to make those available on the class instance. Down in our git by id function, we can use this.htp to make a git call and set up the then callback. The function needs to return a promise, so we start with the return call. Then use this dot dollar sign HTTP to get our HTTP service. Call the git function, passing in the URL to our API endpoint for getting a user by ID, and then call the then function. The then function expects a callback function, and as we start to write it, we get IntelliSense from the Angular type definition file showing us what that signature looks like. We will create a lambda function here that receives a response parameter and returns the data from that response. If we check our error list, we can see that we get messages about some missing type defs. We need to give that parameter, which is the response from our API endpoint, a type, as well as the return type that our inline function is going to deliver to the promise resolution. At this point, we are entering the cross-domain zone. Up to this point, we have been writing client-side code that has been working with data in its own domain. This function is calling across into our app domain and is receiving an object whose structure is defined by the API domain. So, we have to make a decision here on how we want to establish what that data structure looks like to our client app. Let's discuss two ways we can do that. One way would be to type data coming from our API using the any type keyword. If we do this, we effectively tell TypeScript to treat that object as dynamic. While this takes us out of a typed world, it does provide us with a bit of flexibility in terms of allowing the API domain model to change and not have it tightly coupled with our client app domain. Another way would be to establish a type in our client app domain that represents the data object from the API. For this course, we will go that route. Now, there are other ways to approach this as well, and you should analyze and pick the one that works well for your app needs, your team size, and your development workflow practices. Just be aware that living in a TypeScript world will result in needing to handle this scenario, something that may not have been an issue to deal with if you weren't using TypeScript. Okay, we have our an iUser interface that we will have written to represent the user data. So let's use that as our type data returned from the API endpoint, and also use it as our return type for our function in the then function call. For the response parameter, we can use ng dot i http promise callback arg as the type, which supports a generic for the data type. In the angle brackets, we use our i user interface. For the return type of our inline function, we use our iUser interface as well. The last thing we need to do here in our service file is to add the Angular module service registration call below our service TypeScript class instead of above it, recalling that we learned in our previous clip that the compiled code for the class does not get elevated. With our service created and the TypeScript details all worked out, Let's head out into the controller world and put it to use.
to see what TypeScript experiences we may run into out there in the wild. If we revisit our navigation controller, we can update it to use our user service to get the current user and set the full name. We can add our app.services.userService to our inject list and add a constructor parameter named user service, remembering to give it a type, which will be app.services.iUserService. Notice that we get IntelliSense as we type because we have our TypeScript module for app.services and we have set up our interfaces in there to use the export keyword. We can call the getUserID function off of our user service, again, receiving IntelliSense for the function and its signature. See that it expects a string for the unique ID, so we can pass that current user dot user ID. And since it returns a promise, we get IntelliSense for the promise functions available. So let's call the then function and set up an inline function in the Lambda syntax, which will get a user parameter of type app.services.iUser. Our inline function is not going to return anything, so we type the return value as void. And in the body of our function, we can set the vm.fullName using our user object, first name, and last name properties. Switching back over to our user service TypeScript file, we can recap what we've covered. We learned how to use TypeScript interfaces for our Angular services, which we export to make them available across our app files. We wrote a TypeScript class to represent our Angular service. Since the architecture of Angular is based on injection at its core, we have the benefit of not needing to export our TypeScript classes because we are not actually creating instances of them in other files. We learned the TypeScript shorthand for making our constructor parameters available on our class instance, and we use the heck out of type annotations to tell the specific story of how the pieces of our service work, from the interface all the way down through the guts of our service functions. In our next clip, we will take a look at Angular factories in TypeScript.